Hi, everyone. Welcome to Speakeasy JS, the meetup for mad science, hacking, and experiments. I'm Faros, and I'll be your host this afternoon. Mad science is about building things that make people say, I didn't know that was possible. And today, we're joined by Justine Tunney. Um, hey, how's it going? Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm super excited that you're here. Um, I've uh, been an admirer of the stuff that you've been building for, uh, for I guess, several months now. Um, your projects have been taking, I guess, Hacker News by storm. I've seen stuff on the, on the front page several times. So it's great to have you. Yeah, it's definitely been making a lot of people happy in that community. Um, uh, and uh, thank you for noticing. I'm looking forward to presenting some of the work here um, today. Yeah, totally. Um, I, so for those who don't know, Justine was uh, formerly uh, at Google for a bit, and uh, they ran OccupyWallStreet.org website and the Twitter handle for a while. And um, if you check out the uh, just you know, your web page is, is full of really cool projects that definitely are mad science and de definitely the kind of stuff that we like to uh, feature here at Speakeasy. So um, yeah, so I'm just, uh, again, I'm thrilled that you that you said yes to, uh, to, to share it with us today. And uh, I guess you also said you haven't um, spoken about it before. So this is gonna be a really exciting uh, opportunity for everyone. Yeah, this is the first interview or talk I've given on the subject matter. That's amazing. Cool. So yeah, um, I guess one thing I'll say before we start is um, we're going to try out a new thing this week. So for those of you who've been to Speakeasy before, you know that we like to do a social happy hour at the end. Um, and for this week, we're going to try a different platform for that. Um, it's called Rambly, and it's used at a bunch of other JavaScript meetups, uh, most famously JSLA. Um, and so the way it works is at the end, I'll, I'll send a link out to everybody. But if you want to check it out now, this is the link on the screen here. It's uh, ramble slash speakeasyjs. And that's where we're going to go at the end. Um, and it's this really cool spatial audio uh, chat application where you can walk around, and we're going to use it to sort of do a, uh, a virtual equivalent of a meetup. And uh, we'll be able to ask questions of Justine at the end. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Cool. So yeah, with that, um, I, yeah, you can take it away if you're ready. I am ready. Um, so I'm going to be giving a talk on a mad science web server that i wrote called red bean i originally wrote this back in november because i built a c library and i wanted to sort of like show off its capabilities and you know like no one paid attention to it for months and then a link just sort of like got posted on hacker news you know and it just like totally totally blew up like everybody was like completely thrilled with this and i hope after watching this i can get you thrilled about red bean too so let's go to the slides um red bean the goal is you know as you mentioned i worked on occupy you know liberate your web apps i think that's a lofty goal so here's what Red Bean, Cosmopolitan, LibC, and actually Portable Executable um, are together in this circumstance. Red Bean is a conventional HTTP server. It's written in a conventional language. It's written in C, although you don't have to write C if you use it, like you can write Lua. Um, however, it does one thing radically different, which is it has this polyglot executable format that has so many cool properties. Um, in terms of portability and just like ease of development and liberating your apps that will be explained in the following slides. Um, overall, the goals and like use cases is, um, when, when I worked at Google, I worked on something called TensorBoard and there was a use case where we needed to be able to distribute a web application that runs offline because you know not everything can necessarily be a cloud service. And, you know, like the how difficult that was, you know, was one of the things that like motivated me to like work on this problem and build Red Bean. It's like, how how do we, for instance, like, you know, compile native code so that it runs on all operating systems? And Red Bean does it in a completely new way where there's only a single binary file. Like I'm sure many of you have used Go where you need to download, you need to cross compile a separate executable for each like target you want to deploy to. 
it's like, oh, you use FreeBSD? Here's the FreeBSD executable. And they're all like huge. Um, and <clears throat> where Red Bean is different <clears throat> is it's just a single tiny native executable that just runs on everything. So you don't have those ad additional steps. There's no dependencies. You don't have to ask people to like install the Java virtual machine and uninstall the ask toolbar. It's meant to be as simple as possible, like in the sense that of making native development as simple as web development. You know, like we can we can write an HTML page with JavaScript that runs on everybody's browser regardless of their operating system. Why can't we do that with native programs too? Because sometimes we need native programs for things like math, you know? So the basic um, installation step is there's no installer. You just download the redbean.com executable. That's like an old throw, like um, extension from the DOS days. This is, it means the same thing as exe. You chmod it, you run it, and it starts a web server on your local machine on port 8080 by default. And what you do is like after you've run Redbean, you just bring it up in your web browser and you'll see something like this. By default, it just shows you a listing page of the stuff that's inside your Redbean because these executables, these com files, also happen to be zip archives. Um, and that's one of the coolest properties about like having this polyglot format, um, which we'll get into more later. Um, so he here's how you edit your red bean. You can use any GUI. Like if you use Unix or Mac, there's a zip command where you can just like add files to the .com file. So if you have like an HTML page or a Lua page or some images, you just put it inside the zip file and it stays there and then when you run it again it will just like serve those assets as though they were from the local file system it's pretty cool and that's what makes it so easy to distribute like you can once you've put stuff in your red bean you can share it with your friends you can post it online um whatever app you've built like People on FreeBSD, Mac, et cetera, they're all gonna be able to like instantly use it without any additional effort or like cross-compiling or Jenkins clusters. It just works. Um, and it has a dynamic language. Now, this is something that's new that didn't exist, like when it went viral on Hacker News. When Red Bean went viral back in February, um, it was only a static web server. And since then, like we've embedded the Lua programming language because that's just the language that resonated the most with the community. It's pretty cool. Like I, I, I honestly had not used Lua before like this, um, but, but I think it turned out to be like a really appropriate fit. Um, we'll go over some Lua code later. Um, there's another weird use case, and this is also a little bit mad science-y. Um, so I'm sure this audience will, you'll all love it. Um, one of the things I found Red Bean to be cool and particularly suited for is there's a whole bunch of websites like the Hamster Dance that I remember from when I was like a teenager that are no longer online, um, but they can be mirrored. And if I put them inside Red Bean and then configure like Firefox so that the proxy server is Red Bean, its virtual hosting will sort of like act as its own de facto private version of the internet where like all, all traffic is going like to the assets stored in the zip and I can just browse the web as I normally would. Like I've even been thinking about like, you know, doing a quick Lua script that like um, emulates Alta Vista. <laughs> it would be pretty interesting, but that's one thing, um, one cool use case you can consider. Now, the thing I'm most proud of is in the way that I built this is that Red Bean is like totally first principles project. Um, it's not it's not reinvent everything like Urbit. Um, it, it's generally conventional POSIX and CC, but I, I, I built everything from the ground up, including the C library to be as fast um, and efficient 
as possible. And one of the ways that shows is if you consider the footprint. Now we know we all know how huge electron apps are, or like you know the JDK or .NET, even Go, even Go, which was like remarkably, remarkably lightweight compared to those. Like Red Bean, Red Bean totally takes the cake. Like, and 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 the most interesting thing to consider is that it runs on six operating systems in a single file, and all the other tools that have been built to date. Um, it always involves cross-compiling for multiple platforms. So like with Go, in, instead of being six megabytes for one binary, you've got six times six megabytes for all the different platforms. And having to distribute those um, separately, it would not have, something like Red Bean would not have been possible in the cross-compilation world. Because what are you going to do? You're going to add your web application to each zip file separately. The goal is to be able to like sort of develop on it and just go. Um, and that's what it helps enable you to do. Um, there's also memory usage. Um, another, another instance where, you know, say it with numbers, like Red Bean is very resource efficient. It's uh, but particularly when it comes to latency. And this is one of the cool things about the design of using sort of the executable zip structure as a file system. It allows us to avoid system calls, um, which have gone much slower since things like Spectre and Meltdown. And I managed to get it down to where an HTTP request for a gzip encoded response only needs to issue one system call that just copies memory and kernel space to the wire. And it goes, and, and it turns out that this makes Red Bean like faster than any web server I've seen so far. Um, I did these benchmarks like on my personal computer. Um, I'm sure you can like try to reproduce them yourselves. You can most likely get it to go faster if you turn to in the kernel. Um, but it's just a, a, a great way of demonstrating like when the central directory is a continuous blob of memory that's mmapped into RAM. Um, you can make things go really fast. Um, throughput. This, this is the thing people love the most. It's like Red Bean can do a million QPS on just like standard PC that costs like $1,000. Um, and those are gzip encoded. And this is something people normally don't capture in benchmarks. Like we fail to consider every browser requests gzip encoded responses. So like, why aren't we running our benchmarks where gzip encoding is like the norm? Um, so like normally with something like Nginx, if you ask for gzip, it goes slower. With Red Bean, it's sort of the other way around, um, where anything you store in your zip is usually gzip encoded by default. So if you ask for it to not be content encoded, then it, then it applies the expensive computations to decompress it. And what's even more interesting, you know, coming from a Python background, because TensorBoard was written in Python, like how remarkably slow Python is com at HTTP serving compared to something like Red Bean with Lua. Like if you write an on HTTP request handler in Lua with Red Bean, you can, you can literally make it go a million requests per second. And it's just incredible. Like I've never seen like a high level programming language that's scripted um, and just you know stored in the zip file go that go that fast, you know. Um, so on to the next slide. Now, this this segment I'm going to go more in depth into like what exactly is the magic that makes all these technology all these you know num good numbers and portability possible. And at the heart of it all is really this like remarkable insight I stumbled upon with actually portable executable. So one day while studying old code, I realized that it was possible to have, have a Windows MZ executable also be a Unix edition shell script because it turned out in the earliest versions of Unix, um, shell scripts didn't have the shebang line at the top. 
they were just like, you know, naked scripts that just ran. And ever since then, ever since, gosh, that must've been back in like the early seventies, ever since then, Unix distros have preserved that backwards compatibility. And like, for the most part, we all, we all forgot about it. Like, you know, who knew that you could like emit the shebang line. And uh, when I found out about that, I was like, oh my gosh, I can make Windows executables that run on Mac, Linux, and all the BSDs too. And, and as, as soon as I came to that realization, like it, it was a game changer for me. Like I couldn't believe that no one had done it before. I couldn't even believe that it was even possible until I actually did it. And it took a whole lot of work. It was one of the hardest things I ever worked on. Um, but I'm glad that, you know, I hope the results speak for themselves and you get some good use out of them. Oh, and, and another thing is like in terms of booting from BIOS, like in addition to running on all the existing operating systems, um, these executables are operating systems in and of themselves. So let's uh, go over some of the structure. Now, I'm sure I'm sure it's not considered like, you know, the most exciting thing to have like text dumps in a talk. Um, I feel like it's important in this case because the only way I was able to invent something like this was just by staring at these hex dumps day in and day out um, for months. And you can see some of the structure of the binary content like the MZ, this basically means it's a Windows executable. And you know what we do is we do this quoting hack where we escape the binary content to make the shell ignore it. And then the shell comes down here and it, it runs this shell script where it basically printfs the binary header for Linux and BSD back to the start of the executable and then re-execs itself. That's, that's the basic trick that it uses to, to um, support multiple operating systems using a single file. And it also supports multiple architectures too. Like all these binaries are by default x86. So if the host architecture isn't x86, then the shell script can ask QMU to run to emulate it. So it runs anyway. So they really are truly like universal binaries. Um, but the code morphing goes even further than that. In the case of Redbean, it's actually able to use this like heroic hack where the executable, once it's loaded, unmaps itself from memory, um, undoes the self-modification where it like replaced the header and then maps itself back into memory. So that way, you know, the, the executable isn't permanently damaged. It doesn't sacrifice the distributability once you've run it. And better yet, it allows the Lua API to give you the ability to use the zip executable as an object store. Like you, you can store documents in it as though it were MongoDB. So it's not only like, you know, your assets that are distributable, it's your database too, all in a single file. So let's go back to these binary hex dumps. In this case, we're using um, code page 437, which is what all the best hex editors use. Um, here, here we get a better glimpse of the BIOS bootloader which is up here, it's like 512 bytes. That's a master boot record. Um, here's the shell script when we go down and we can go further down and you start seeing the um, support structure for other operating systems too. Like this little piece of binary is how we support OpenBSD because that just so happened, every, every operating system it turned out has its own like initialization ritual where there's like one particular thing that they cared about. And it just so turned out by like, you know, some sheer coincidence that none of them overlapped in an incompatible way, which is what like enabled actually portable executable to support six different systems. Um, here's like the Mako, um, 
Mako structure down here. That's from Mac OS. And at the very bottom, and, and this was another like amazing insight. I was so excited when I found this out. Like what makes a zip file a zip file is the magic number goes at the end of the file. So it doesn't conflict with the executable formats and the polyglot format can sort of synthesize zip too. And you'll see like we use this to store like a um, file system with time zone info. Like one of the biggest problems people have these days is like no one can get their software to like run on anything except a specific version of a specific Linux distro. And a lot of it boils down to like, you know, maybe Fedora puts zone info and in user share and maybe uh, Debian puts it in like, you know, user local. You, you never know, but those little incompatibilities just like break distributability of apps and like make things completely incompatible. And that's just within one operating system. And it turned out like, you know, I think this is a really simple, elegant solution. You know, the aspects of the operating system that you need, just bundle it inside the executable and then you never have to worry about like whatever, whatever interesting and unusual way distros and underlying operating systems just so happen to structure things. Now let's talk about the most recent feature that was added to Redbean, which is the Lua server page support. The way it works is any file with the extension .lua that you put inside your Redbean, um, the Redbean web server is going to execute that when it's dynamic serving, sort of like a PHP page, or uh, I wouldn't say similar to CGI, but I'm sure you get the general idea. Um, it allows you to create dynamic content. It's pretty snappy. Um, and it makes the possibilities for like extending Redbean and making it yours totally endless. Now, so far the Redbean API has about 94 functions you can use, um, as well as like something equivalent to the Python RE module. It's mostly low level and the reason why it's low level is because I've spent the last couple of years working on C. It's like, I don't think I'm gonna be the kind of person who's gonna build a good web framework that people are gonna love. But one thing I know is that I can build like all the low level support functions that like whatever framework or library you build on top of Redbean, it, it's gonna have a much easier time and it's gonna go really snappy. And that's exactly, uh, oh, here, here's an example of the low level API. You can see like the various different levels of escaping, visualizing control codes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm sure the slides will be available if you want to like sort of go into more details. Um, but in terms of frameworks, um, it turns out someone already built a framework for Redbean and they, they've been on the issue tracker for Cosmopolitan LibC and they've been contributing. Uh, his name is James Milne and it's called AppDam. And it's still a work in progress, similar to Redbean itself. Um, but, you know, I think it's totally worth supporting his efforts. And because I'd love to see people building web frameworks and getting excited about Redbean as a technology. It, as of this week, it's on version 1.0. So it is now something I'm like recommending people definitely, definitely consider using. But uh, here, here's an example of the higher level syntax that um, his framework offers. Um, and this is sort of like built on top of the low level Redbean APIs. Um, so it's worth giving a try. Um, so like one of the uh, notes I'd like to wrap up on is, you know, one of the biggest concerns, particularly like if you work for a big corporation is a, a lot of people have strong opinions about uh, licenses. And in many ways with Redbean and Cosmopolitan Lipsy, I've sought to sidestep those issues by just making it as permissive as possible. Mm -hmm. It's licensed ISC. All its dependencies are permissive. They're just notice license like MIT and BSD. Mm -hmm. um, and it also is legally prim and proper 
you know, per the standards of like, you know, a big professional corporation in the sense that um, most people don't do this, but BSD licenses require that you distribute the license along with the software. So what, what Red Bean does is it just, it, it programs the linker to just embed it in the binary. So it doesn't compromise the mission of having single file executables. It's the, so on that note, Red Bean is the web server with a heart. If you read the source code, it's got a heartbeat. Um, you'll know it if you see it. And I just wanna thank you all for taking the time to listen and I hope you enjoy Red Bean. Now, do we have time to do a demo? Yes, we do, go for it. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a uh, website real quick. Um, are you seeing everything okay? Uh-huh. Okay, so like here on the website, you'll see the standard red bean distribution. And there's also a few other you can choose from. In this case, we're gonna try red bean demo because it includes a whole bunch of other stuff inside of it, like um, Lua code. So that downloaded probably to my downloads folder. Okay. So what we do here is we chmod plus red bean demo, and then we can just like run it on the shell. Copy the URL. And by the way, keep in mind, there's actually a Lua API function that will open up the browser automatically if you program the red bean to do that. But here's what we've got. As you can see, like red bean noticed, we got the request. And by default, if you haven't put an index.html file inside the root directory of your red bean, um, it's just gonna display a listing of everything that's in the zip file which in this case should be consistent if we run the unzip command. So it literally is, <laughs> it literally is a zip file. Um, oh, and if we run the file command, I wonder what that's gonna say. DOS MBR boot sector. <laughs> <laughs> so it has no idea like what these actually portable executables are. I mean, I guess that that is true. It does have a master boot record. Um, <laughs> like the, the, these these literally do like boot, boot from BIOS. I mean, like I've yet to put like you know an E one thousand driver inside of it, so it can talk over the network. Right now, it's just strictly like serial UART and like very basic ring zero operating system functionality. But the capability is there, so it's like if we want to build it because we can, like for a mad science project you know, we can do that. So to go back to this, um, let's take a look at like some of these pages, like redbean.lua. Here's an actually dynamically generated page where I can pass it parameters and it understands them. I can submit a form and has those parameters, it sees the headers. I can do XHRs. And there's regular expressions, of course. That's actually something that doesn't come included by default in the Lua language. And like Red Bean had to sort of like bolt it on. And best of all, the Lua code can intro introspect the um, zip format and it can like list things, it can retrieve assets, it can store assets. So let's try doing a live demo of running the hello.lua handler to see if it adds a slash high file at the end when we load this. I think it worked. <laughs> yes. So as you can see, we've mutated the zip file. So there's now a, a slash high file in there. And if we open up the command line utility, where we cd into downloads and we unzip el red bean demo, you can now see that high file has actually been stored in the executable. So the executable is like modifying itself. Um, 
which which to me is just like the coolest thing in the world. Um, I can't believe that works. <laughs> <laughs> it took a pretty heroic hack, like you know, uh, uh, like a hundred lines of assembly that just like unmaps the executable while it's running. It's like replacing an engine while the car's on in motion on the highway. <laughs> But yeah, there's other cool stuff in here, um, like there's static pages, and these. Oh, and there's also virtual hosting. Like here is a live demo running as a public web server. So if you want to, like, you know, you know, poke around with the online instance at redbean.justine.lol, go check it out. It even has public um, monitoring statistics. So if you're like an SRE and you want to like write monitoring dashboards, you can just like program your scripts to pull the status Z page, read the numbers and chart them. And that way, like if you productionize Redbean, um, you will have like all the vital health statistics. You'll, you'll know if something is going wrong um, or if so, you know something's using too much memory particularly if you use an operating system like FreeBSD or NetBSD. This uh, live demo is running on NetBSD, uh, I'm sorry, FreeBSD, um, where we actually get certain R usage accounting information such as, you know, like average, average like memory usage type things. Um, it comes out a little higher than if you do otherwise, um, but, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and I think that just about does it for the live demo. Um, should we move on to questions? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, I just want to say, wow, uh, my reaction is, I, I oh my god, uh, what, a, what, a, what a cool project. Uh, <laughs> so if, if anyone has questions for Justine, post them in the chat now. But um, So we'll keep an eye out for that, and we'll, we'll, ask, the, we'll ask the best questions. But, uh, wow, I just, I can't believe that you made something like a zip and an executable, and then you <laughs> embedded a Lua interpreter. Like, by the way, every, as you were going, like, I was like, I wonder, um, I wonder if they're going to talk about, you know, uh, you know, I wonder if they're going to figure out, you know, that you, you, like, could add dynamic stuff to this, and then you did it, and then everything, everything I kept thinking, you, like, did it. So, like, the, you embedded a, a proxy uh, server so that you can make, like, you know, old sites uh, load if they match uh, like something in the in the red bean, and then and then you made the whole executable into an operating system as well uh, that can boot, and then like, and then I was thinking like, okay, what about like since you have a dynamic scripting language, can you like upload stuff into the into the you know red bean and update it and make it that like actually like change itself and uh, do that while it's running. And then you did that too, and I was just like, and then, and then on top of that, the performance is good, and it runs on six operating systems, and the binary size is like less than a megabyte. Like I was like, this, this is ridiculous. This, you must be lying or something. This can't be real. It's such a good hack that it's like it doesn't seem actually real. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm just really, really impressed. So, well, like I was saying, uh, when I first started working on this, I, I could not even believe. I, I, I thought I was going mad. I couldn't believe it was possible because it was just so cool until I actually did it. And, you know, a, a lot of what, how this project started was just like, you know, me just, you know, working on my own, trying to figure this thing out, you know, making sure that the darn thing works before I start bringing it to the public um, for everybody else to enjoy. Because it's just like such a creative concept that like it really, it really needs to be executed on properly. And that's exactly you know what I've aimed to do over the last six months, and I'm glad that it's finally, as of this week, on its 1.0 release. Well, congratulations! That's so cool. Yeah. So I mean, I'll just ask you my my questions. I'll selfishly ask mine first. So I I'm like shocked that none of the operating systems had incompatible requirements for their binary files. Like um, I'm surprised they just they just it seems like you're saying they tolerate like whatever random garbage is at the beginning of a file and they just skip it until they see something that they understand. Is that roughly right or like? Um, like a lot they do ignore a lot of things, um, but there's always like one or two things that they don't ignore. <laughs> Like, like, for example, the thing, the thing Windows cares about is the first two bytes of the file and byte 60 through 64 of the file. 
where which has the um, MZ letters and the pointer to the next header. And everything else, it just ignores, which means we can like put a BIOS bootloader in there or like, you know, even embed other, other data like my initials. <laughs> um, and like Linux, Linux, for instance, um, in the ELF executable format, there is a field that specifies the operating system. Linux completely ignores it, but FreeBSD doesn't. So, so like if you actually like open up um, your Red Bean um, L in, when it's in ELF mode and uh, look at what the operating system tag says on Linux, it'll say it's a FreeBSD executable um, because that's just the, the field that only FreeBSD cares about. And if it's not set to FreeBSD, then it won't run on FreeBSD. So, the, so there was like a bunch of constraints for the different operating systems and then they were like, all somehow satisfiable without conflicting with each other. I know it was remarkable. <laughs> that is remarkable. That is really, really remarkable. <laughs> oh man. So, so then, and also the other thing that was blowing my mind is you mentioned that the Lua script, uh, the thing you demoed at the very end, it could actually um, get a request from a user and then add files to the Red Bean while it's running. So does, does the operating does the operating system let a executable or can you modify a running executable and have it take effect in the currently running program? Is that pretty easy to do across operating systems? It is not easy to do. Um, um, currently, currently it's only um, supported on Mac, Linux, and FreeBSD. Um, it's go it's going to be possible to do on the other ones. I just haven't implemented it yet. But the way it works is under normal circumstances, if you try to open a running executable in write mode or like change it in any way, uh, you'll get an error code called eTextBusy, um, which is basically meant to, uh, intended to protect the integrity of the executable. Um, so I discovered, and I don't know if anybody's ever documented this before, but it just so happens to trace that on these three operating systems, if you call MunMap to unmap the um, pages of memory that are associated with the executable, so it's completely cleared out of memory, then that um, sort of closes the executable file implicitly so you can reopen it with the right permission, map it back into memory, and then jump back into the code. Um, and then you can do whatever you want. You can change it, you can add assets, and it's still it's still a little bit of a work in progress. Out of all the things in Red Bean, in terms of like production worthiness, the, this uh, the mutation would be probably the least production worthy because uh, right now it works reliably, but it works in an append only manner. And a lot of like you know the 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 cool things for like compacting it and like making sure the time complexity characteristics are outstanding that hasn't been implemented yet. It's mostly at the proof of concept stage and it works. Well, that's still really impressive, wow. Um, that, it's amazing how, how many of these, I mean, it's, it, you just had, you had to find uh, undocumented feature after undocumented feature and like, I don't know, just, just the whole thing. Uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. I'm just like uh, a little bit at a loss for words that how cool this is. <laughs> yeah, it almost, it almost feels like uh, I'm, I'm sort of taking a, uh, studying systems as though it were a science, even though it isn't necessarily a science, but it feels like it sometimes when I like, you know, stumble upon these just things that make cool, cool hacks like this possible. And it gets people really excited. Like, you know, people on Hacker News loved it. This was the, the top number three top show HN article of all time on Hacker News. And I think that's saying something for just how much of a demand there really is for something that works in this way. And it's really, it, you know, it really um, still amazes me that no one's done it before because anybody could have done this. Um, and, and when I think back to the motivations like uh, of why our current status quo might've been the case, the, the best reason I've found so far was what happened to IBM with OS2. Um, Actually, portable executable is named after portable executable. Um, and the portable executable format was a thing back in the early 90s, back when it was actually portable. 
And the systems it was portable between was Windows and, and IBM OS2. And what happened was like OS2 made this kind of gambit where it's like, we're gonna be open with our executable format. And what ended up happening in practice was everybody used that openness to migrate away from it. So after that day, like all the all the big companies like Microsoft, they be, they became convinced that if if they're if we're going to be open, then then people people aren't going to you know sort of like stay in the operating system land that we've created. So with something like Red Bean actually portable executable, never in a million years would a big company have built this. It had to be built by like, you know, just an indie developer like me, just trying to have fun. Um, um, because I have like no stake in the operating systems game. Like I'm not trying to build a platform. I'm just trying to build a cool toy and pe that people loved enough that I've worked on it so hard to like, you know, make it less of a toy and, you know, hopefully something that can, you know, change the world one line of code at a time. Well, that's the true hacker spirit, right? Like you, you, uh, I mean, you weren't satisfied with just uh, like accepting that, I guess like different operating systems have different binary formats and that's what, what, I, what we're have, we have to live with. It was like, well, you know, what were the true rules of the system? Like you actually figured out what all the constraints were and then you, you figured out that they actually don't conflict with each other. <laughs> and if you, if you push hard enough, they actually, you know, you can actually make them all work. Um, that's that's the like that's actually like the uh, the true essence of hacking is like the is like finding the difference between the written rules of a system and the, the true rules that underlie it. Um, and you found the true rules, and in this case, uh, proved that you can you can make an actual portable executable. And so speaking of the true rules, there's something that's uh, actually worth sharing um, while we're here, which mm -hmm. is the magic numbers file that underlies all this. So. When I first started presenting this um, concept, the actually portable executable to the public, um, one of the things I talk about is, you know, there's uh, beneath all the names and the APIs, there's these things called ABIs, which is application binary interface. And it's sort of like the API beneath the API. And it's the most stable one too, because operating systems can't break these without breaking themselves. Like if you change the ABI, every binary you've ever built goes poof. You can't run it anymore. So these things tend to change even less than API breakages happen. And if you look at the magic numbers and like compare them to sort of like history, um, you'll notice a lot of them are sort of have a lot in common. Like um, I'm sure many of you have heard of eInter, which is a very important status code in POSIX systems for like Unix and stuff. And if you look at the difference between Linux, um, Mac OS, FreeBSD, like they all give it basically the same number, except of course for Windows. Windows gives it a totally different number because Windows is Windows. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I, I, I discovered that the reason why that is, is because they all share a common lineage with like um, the operating system that was built at Bell Labs, which is sort of like their common ancestor. And if you look at the number history as features got added over the years, um, as we scroll down, you can see that the numbers start to diverge as the years and the timelines sort of move forward. It's like we go further and by this point, you know, they're totally different. So mm -hmm. it was like, I felt like by staring at these numbers and like sort of like gauging them as a tool for measuring consensus, I was able to like, you know, come to a lot of conclusions about like the way these operating systems behave. And that's one of the reasons why I was able to, to build the tools that I built. Um, because the the you know the numbers the numbers tell a story and they don't lie. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. So uh, I think I'll ask you one last question and then we'll we'll go to questions in the chat. Um, so my my uh, my last question is uh, is I'm just curious what sparked your interest in this area because you you, meant, you mentioned that you were staring at hex dumps for for day in and day out and yeah. and um, also 
you know, that, that you were also, you mentioned that you were looking at old code and that was how you learned that you could omit the shebang line and have it still run on, uh, I think it was on Unixy systems. So yeah, like, I'm just curious, what, why were you staring at hex dumps and, and looking at all that old code? And, and was it, did you have a use case in mind or did, was it just kind of, it, the insight just came upon you when you were, when you were doing this? Because working on TensorFlow spoiled open source for me. Like I got to learn, like when I was working on TensorFlow, like, you know, uh, I, I would triage issues and I, I would hear like a, about every, every instance of things breaking and how things can go wrong in terms of open source software. And like, we're, you know, I never would have had any idea like what the acronym ABI stands for if it wasn't for the fact that I worked on TensorFlow because ABI breakages were a constant struggle because you know Google needed to distribute TensorFlow to all these different platforms, have it work, otherwise the project couldn't be successful. And like overcoming like all those portability barriers to like binary distribution and, and making open source frameworks just work, you know, helping helping them do that. I learned so much and I just, you know, couldn't believe like, um, you know, some of these issues I, I'd never considered before, you know, hadn't been solved already. And after that, I felt like, you know, since since I got all this state on it, you know, maybe maybe I should be someone who like, you know, chips in the time to solve it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's like, like you were saying, someone else could have done it, but you, you happen to have all the state loaded in your mind. And so it just was like, um, almost, uh, yeah, like obvious at that point. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's cool. Um, so let's take a question from the chat. Um, we have a, a question from Tiny Fluff uh, here. What's your test rig like when you tweak the format? How do you test it's compatible with all the different platforms? Um, well, um, the thing I do, and I can probably um, actually demo that right now, is um, if I see the into Cosmo. So I have uh, Cosmopolitan repository is like built on a single make file. Um, and if I just like do make J8 in the repository on like a Linux system, it builds the whole thing and it runs all the test binaries, but it only runs them on Linux. Let's see if we can make that faster. It's a huge repository, by the way, it builds more than 10,000 objects. Um, but if I want to like run it on a whole bunch of different operating systems, such as FreeBSD, OpenBSD, et cetera, et cetera, um, I just run the make test command. And what it does is it SSHs into all those hosts. It, it deploys like a, a, an ephemeral daemon that sort of accepts requests where it uploads the executable test files runs them and it reports back if they're successful or not. And it looks like this repository is in a semi broken state right now because I was working on it and was, you know, anticipating demoing it, but you can download the working version directly from the GitHub. Give it a try yourself. So, so you basically just run these as like, uh, are these VMs or just like some servers here? Oh, I don't use I don't use Docker or anything. Um, like the, the the development environment, like while the executables can run on pretty much any operating system, the the development for me has been like entirely focused on Linux. Um, since it's more about deploy anywhere rather than develop anywhere, um, and one of the things that's like helped me accomplish so much in such a short period of time is like it vendors a, a specific version of GCC binaries in the code base. So it, I don't ha I've never needed to worry about things like supporting five different compilers at five different versions. You know, it's all about like reducing the dimensionality of the support vector. Um, so like using that to the project's advantage has certainly helped. Um, but in terms of like the development experience, if, if you want to hack on the Cosmo code base with the actual GitHub sources, you have to use Linux. There's just no other way. Mm -hmm. Right. 
So there's another question in the chat. Has, has anyone in the community taken a stab at implementing WebSockets yet? Um, not yet, but uh, there, it, and no, um, it's certainly something that I want for Redbean, and I'm sure many other people want it too. So if you want to take a stab at it, go for it. Nice. Uh, another quick fire one. Um, would it be possible to hack in ARM support? Um, <laughs> Um, it, it's something I, I, I've thought about. Um, ARM is tricky. It's something I will be first to admit I don't understand it as well as x86. I'd like to understand it better um, because I know um, there's a lot of people out there who um, are very enthusiastic about ARM. And, you know, the project has gotten a lot of similar feedback. Um, so maybe in the future, I, I believe supporting ARM is possible. It might be ugly. Um, I believe it's doable. It's simply a question of like, will it happen and can it happen like given like the resources the project has. But thank mm -hmm. you for asking. Yeah, that's the thing about open source, right? Like as soon as you start talking about your work, the requests start coming in. So they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's the trade-off. But I love that you mentioned that you distribute the licenses along with the software um, because most people don't realize that they're required by a lot of these licenses to actually do that. So that's really cool that you're actually embedding them right into the, yeah, into the theme. I, I try to take a very conscientious approach to the development of this project. Like, I want to make sure that everybody who participates and contributes, like, you know, gets gets the credit that the the, the text says they deserve and, you know, um, and that's something you'll notice in like the release notes um, where people who've contributed to the project, like it's a great way to sort of like shine um, a flashlight on their work and, you know, bring it to a broader audience. So if you want to like write something like WebSockets for this project, it's like if you help Cosmopolitan be successful, then it'll help you. Yeah, totally. That's great. Yeah. So, um, so speaking of the the community, so tell me about that. Like you mentioned that you've been developing this since the like you know since everyone heard about it on on, on Hacker News, you've you've been continuing to work on it, and there's even people who've made like a web framework for it. Um, so like, uh, yeah, how is the how has the community aspect been for you know for you, and like, um, what what can people help with? Well, um, it, it it's been slowly and steadily growing. Um, I think it's like really exciting. Um, there are a whole bunch of opportunities for things that could be worked on. Like WebSockets was one of them. Um, if you want to like learn more, just like check out the issue tracker. Um, but ultimately, like the bread and butter of Cosmopolitan and Redbean boils down to a lot of like low level work that most people wouldn't necessarily consider sexy. Like uh, sort of dealing with these ABIs and system interfaces. And there have been some people who've been contributing who are really enthusiastic about that. It's like, yes, I'm going to make this IO control implemented for, you know, all the different BSDs. And in many cases, it's a thankless job. But, you know, I think this is a project that has the potential to change that. So, like, when it comes to the nitty gritty details, I would say focus on that. Like if, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with it, you might find out that you really like it because that's what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, I, I spent uh, many years working on uh, WebTorrent, which is this, uh, you know, JavaScript uh, torrent client. And I thought that, you know, um, you know, it was lo considered low level for a lot of open source projects, at least in the in the JS community, and uh, and uh, you know for that reason, it was actually in some ways hard to find contributors who had the requisite experience with networking and with with low level protocols to be able to actually make contributions. So the number of contributors has always been relatively low. Um, but um, but when you when you find someone who does really like drive with it, they're really really inter inter interested in it. So um, so I think I imagine that would be similar for for um, Red Bean and actually Portable Executable as well. Um, I'll put the link on the screen too for the for the people who want to check out. Um, this is the website link, but I'm sure that you could find the GitHub link from there um, for for people who want to um, take a stab at those those issues you mentioned um, to check it out. Um, yeah, so let's see, do we have any more questions in the chat? Um, 
I think I'll ask another one of mine. Um, so, and then I think maybe we'll go to the social, the social happy hour pretty soon. Um, so people can, can have a chance to talk to you in person. Um, but yeah, so one, one, one of the things I was thinking about is, is you mentioned, so you could just open the zip file up into, in, a, in, a, in a GUI zip editor. You, you showed that at one point. Um, how does that like not corrupt the parts of the file that are like, that shouldn't be modified? Like do, um, are there certain like GUI, per, GUI zip editors that just like muck with parts of the file that would uh, cause red bean, red bean binary to not be valid? binary anymore or is it like mostly fine? Uh, well, uh, I'm sure there's some zip editors that, you know, have philosophical disagreements with the way zip was designed. Uh, when, when Phil Katz invented it, like way back in the day, total, total genius, by the way, um, he, he intended um, one of the use cases to be self-extracting zip archives where he would put a DOS binary at the beginning of the file and, and that's why he sort of like defined the format so the magic number goes at the end. So like when it comes to the way the zip structure is laid out, um, there's all these opportunities for creating sparseness in the format where you can like lay out the records basically wherever you want. And all the gaps, you know, a, a, good, a good zip editor should ignore them. Um, you know, how much the how much they actually do in practice. It depends on the tool. But like one thing with all the zip tools I've used, if there's a big binary blob at the beginning that comes before in the file compared to like any like zip file, it won't get touched. So the binary won't get corrupted. Um, it, 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 the zip operations happen purely towards the end of the file. Okay, wow. I saw the number of different things that had to be right, it had to just fit together to make this whole thing work is it's just yeah. super impressive. Um, cool. Um, and then I guess maybe we'll end on one last question. Like, how do you, um, do you have any advice for people who are interested in working on more interesting projects? Like maybe some engineer who's stuck working at um, like a job that they don't like and they just wish they could work on cooler stuff, maybe some mad science like what you've talked about. Like, do you have any advice on, on, on like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe this is, uh, too much, but yeah, just curious, like, do you have any advice for someone like that or how they could work on, on more radical ideas, stuff that's more fun? Um, I think I, I think with uh, even most day-to-day -day things, there's always like a little mad science opportunity lurking around the corner. If, if you go looking for it, you know, sometimes a, a lot of this, it, 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 it's difficult, um, it, takes time and you just have to, you know, keep going and keep going. And eventually you, you will find those opportunities. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'd recommend. I don't recommend that they rage quit and- uh, No, no, start. no, no. I'm not recommending anybody rage quit. I, I, I'm saying per persevere, like look for the opportunities like within your work where uh, there is, sort of an opportunity to do something unexpected, counterintuitive, but very re rewarding that can enhance your work. And a lot of the times, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, uh, assertive, you have to evangelize um, your ideas um, and communicate them clearly to other people and get them on board. Um, but, it, you know, it's a rewarding process, but uh, it ultimately, like most technology work, like, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, just day in, you gotta keep applying your effort and keep going. Mm -hmm. Cool, well, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, thanks for all the good questions, people. And, um, and uh, yeah, thanks to you, Justine, for, for sharing this with us, super cool. Um, and I, I really hope that some people, um, you know, go to the GitHub and, and tackle some of the issues uh, that you mentioned and make, make it even, uh, an even cooler project. Or, or um, just use it, or just use it. Yeah, that too. Yeah, it's actually surprisingly production ready. I can't believe that. That's the other thing that was shocking about this as I, I thought it was, you know, oftentimes we, we have mad science on here that's like really cool, but you know, you definitely know you would never use it in production and that's fine. That's actually, that stuff is cool, really cool. And, um, and well, it was, it was not 
by any means production worthy a couple months ago. It's just the problem is uh, it, it, it was so successful that I, I just got this idea in my head. It's like people are counting on me to make this, to make this, you know, hunk of junk, something that's like dependable and reliable and, you know, never goes down and has that like sweet, you know, three, nine uptime or even more. Um, and I just spent, <laughs> I just spent like, you know, a couple months doing that to sort of like, help Red Bean be the server, the web server that everybody was hoping it could be. And uh, whether or not I've met that bar is totally up to you to decide. And uh, feedback is very much welcome if you Great. try it. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely try it. Um, yeah. And so I think with that, um, uh, we'll, we'll now go to the social part of the event. So 